and a widower continue to serve as an elder. Uh, then a second must elders' children be Christians. And a third, if elders' children apostatize after leaving home, must the elder resign. So you can start out with those and just continue on. Thank you, Brother Michael. I cannot draw a circle on the chalkboard and write in a particular passage of Scripture to either one of these questions. And so the very best that I could do would be to give you my judgment. And I don't mind giving my opinion about matters as long as I tell you this is my opinion and you accept it as an opinion. We have problems today when people give an opinion as if it were an inspired statement. You can't do that. We ought to use good judgment even with respect to our opinions. Can a widower continue as an elder? No. Anyone else want to <laughs> comment on that? I coined the word a few years ago and I used the word yo. That's midway between yes and no. If you don't know whether it's yes or no, or no or yes, just say yo. But I do not believe that a widower whose companion has passed away would be the husband of one wife. Someone was telling me about a situation where a man wanted to continue as an elder, but his wife had died. He said, well, his wife was in heaven. He still had a wife. She was in heaven. Well, I don't believe that. In heaven we neither marry nor or are given in marriage. He's not still married to that woman in heaven. And if that were the case, and some fraulein came along, wanted to marry him, he couldn't even marry her. He's got a wife in heaven. So, no, I don't believe that. Anybody else have any comments? Did a good job on that one. <laughs> Must elders' children be Christians? I think that's involved in the matter of ruling one's house well. I couldn't conceive of a shepherd being over a bunch of goats out there somewhere or other animals besides sheep could you the shepherd cares for the sheep now how far off am I on that I think the shepherd's influence over his family would be demonstrative of the fact that he knows how to rule to care for influence his own family don't believe it have any good influence over anyone else's children or anyone else at all if he did not influence his own family, his own children. What are you thinking, Brother Cates? No, I wouldn't say all of them have to be Christians. But those who are of accountable age responsible age, why the elder might have a, a stack of children. It's stacked up, you know. And the little babies know it wouldn't have to be Christians. Anyone else want to comment on that? Did a good job. Yeah. If elders' children apostatize after leaving home, 
Must the elder resign? No. Did a good job on that one. Anybody want to comment on that? I don't have any responsibility at all. No responsibility over my children who are gone. Now, I did have at one time. I certainly had a grave responsibility. And all of my children were at home. I baptized every one of them. Taught them the truth and baptized them. But that uh, does not mean that I continue to have a responsibility over them. Our oldest daughter, I think, is way up 40 some odd years of age. My wife knows her age. The youngest daughter is about 43. And I, I don't, I'm not responsible for them as to how they conduct their lives today. They're not responsible for me. Isn't that right? Shake or my or say something. It's I'd like Brother Shannon. I mean, the walls need to talk to me. Anybody have any comment on that? No, you don't need to talk. No. I'm Michael Hatcher from Bellevue. Two comments on the last one. One is the real situation that I know of in which a man had several children. They grew up, left home, the oldest one apostatized. And if a man had to resign as an elder, if a child after he leaves home apostatized, he would have had to resign. But then that oldest son was restored. So again, he would be qualified to be an elder now. Then another one of his children apostatized. And so, according to that, he'd have to get out of the eldership again. And later was, but later was restored. So, <laughs> after a while, it gets to be a rather ridiculous situation. If that is the case, which it is not, as you've already said. The second, <laughs> every time it talks about a wife being in subjection to her husband, it always states her own husband. Could it be that one of the reasons that it says her own husband be that God is showing us that once she leaves home, or once children leave home, they are no longer responsible to their parents. By the statement, her own husband. Because when she was in her father's home, she was subject to someone else's husband, her father. Thank you. I have in the past preached sermons, and I suspect most of you have, on matters pertaining to parents and children. You read the Bible. And you'll find some of the finest parents had children in the Bible they weren't fit for buzzard bait. That's right. Then on the other hand, you'll find some of the sorriest parents, the off-scouring of the earth, they had some of the best children that you could read about. And you still see this. And brethren, that's one thing that, that I don't understand. I've had every kind of psychology that Brother Cates ever thought about. And it, it, it amazes me, really. It does. Now, you give me the answer. Yeah, David. Back there. Uh -huh. David Brown, Spring, Texas. Uh, 
I think it's interesting that most people that try to do something like that seem to think that if the children go wrong, it's automatically, automatically the, the uh, problem of the parents. Adam and Eve were created by God. Adam and Eve sinned. Does that imply that God did wrong? It shows you right there that man was created a free moral agent. And now, as those loving, capable, mature trained, educated parents could be as Christians. None of us can measure up to God. But Adam and Eve sin. So it tends to tell me very quickly that it's not always the parents' fault when the children sin. Moreover, there could not be a judgment day if every single, solitary, accountable person could not stand before God all by his or her lonesome, if you please, and give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. It's true that parents, of course, we all know this, can be bad parents, their influence not be what it ought to be. Well, they have to live closer. But at the same time, uh, it doesn't change a thing regarding each one's own responsibility. And the thing that Michael said I think is interesting because it shows that uh, we get out from under the jurisdiction of our parents at some point. Uh, my mother and daddy are here, but I didn't have to call and ask them could I be on this lectureship. I've been out from under their jurisdiction a long time. They may be very happy about it, but nevertheless, that's that's the case. And uh, dub, dub is the only thing I've ever seen that would make me wonder about whether we ought to reconsider abortion. Is that a question? Well, let's understand for just a moment that not every situation is identical to that that we have right here at Bellevue in Pensacola, Florida, or in Nigeria, Tennessee. There are different kind of societies. We live under what we know as a patriarchal society. There are matriarchal societies. And then there are others that pretty well are balanced both ways. When the church is established in those areas, uh, what do you do in these situations here? I think of the case where Rebecca uh, went all the way from Patan Aram over to become the wife of uh, that favorite son, wonderful son of Abraham. When the servant was sent over, to seek a wife for uh, uh, Abraham's son. Yeah. Uh, she left. She left the water hole down there and, and ceased to be the daughter of that individual for the time being. Went all the way back over into the land of Canaan. And there she became the wife. The bride. Uh, she was not under the care or the subjection, rather, of her father, the Jewel. She wasn't. And so uh, he didn't have a responsibility over her. And she left and went back to Canaan. And uh, she behaved herself, seemed like most of the time at least. Dub, you have something there, brother? <coughs> Dub McClish didn't text it. So, <clears throat> if we take the position that parents are forever responsible for the behavior of their children and that children do not have the freedom after they leave the oversight of their parents to chart out a new course, then we're basically taking a Calvinistic position of perseverance of the saints, it seems to me. Um, I think a lot of preachers have beat parents over the head with train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old he will not depart from it with a misunderstanding of what Solomon's actually saying there. I do not really believe he's talking about the moral or religious direction of life but the aptitude of uh, vocation and natural interest and inclination of that child. 
Uh, this is no argument against uh, parents doing their very best to nurture their children up in the uh, knowledge of the Lord and of the truth. But it's simply to say that uh, when parents have done their very best to do that, and then when children, after they leave home of their own volition, go astray, why on earth should parents be held accountable for that? I've long since thought that Solomon's statement, train up a child, you look that up, it just simply says, show them how to do. Show them how to do. And in that ancient society, they had a responsibility to show a son how to achieve a skill. How to achieve a skill. And they did that. And when you show him how to be a skilled operator, a doctor, lawyer, merchant, chief, rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, or whatever, you show them how. Give them a skill. Give them a trade. And the context involves that. The whole book of Proverbs dealing with that. And when they're old, they'll not depart from you. You've given them a life trade as a Jewish parent. You've trained them. You've shown them how to do something. I don't believe the writer at all is saying you train up or teach a child how to live right. Then when he's old, he won't live wrong. Why, that contradicts what the Bible teaches. It means they never could apostatize. Brother? Uh, Gary Summers, uh, the person that wrote that proverb was trained up properly when he was young, and when he was old, he departed from the faith. Uh, also, uh, Cain and Abel were raised in the same world by the same parents. And you have two opposite personalities. Uh, one faithful and uh, and uh, murdered, and the other one, uh, well, <laughs> what can you say about him? Godless, basically. And they uh, both had the same environment, same parents, same everything. Sure. Sure. Brother Joe? Brother Joseph? This other way, Joe. Excuse me. Brother uh, Kishan, this is um, a passage of scripture that I think you have to, that one must understand in context, and I agree with much of what's been said. In Proverbs chapter 1, you have the um, purpose of the book of Proverbs as well as the benefits in verses 2 through 6. The real proposition of the book is verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning or foundation of knowledge, but the foolish despise wisdom and instruction. Now in verses 10 through 16, you find that wisdom rejects foolish living. In 17 through 19, that this godly wisdom determines man's fate. Verses 20 through 23, godly wisdom demands to be respected. And 24 through 30, it is ignored at great peril. And then 31 through 33, godly wisdom judges the foolish. And in chapter 2, and this is just uh, my opinion on this, I think the key for understanding Proverbs 22, 6 is chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. You have to understand, too, that in the beginning of this book, it is a father's entreaty to his sons. In verses 1 and 2, you have the father's entreaty. My son, if. And these are conditional statements. If thou wilt receive my words and lay up my commandments with thee, so as to incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding. Now that's the Father's entreaty. But now look at the conditions in verses 3 and 4. Now these conditions are not on the part of the Father, but rather they are on the part of the Son. Yea, if thou cry after discernment. That's the desire of the child to do the will of God, to have godly knowledge, to have godly wisdom in his or her life, and lift up thy voice for understanding. And then number two in verse four, if thou seek her as silver, and search for her as for hid treasure. Verse five is the result. Then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. 
Now the principle is in verse 6. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of His mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So on the one hand, you have the parent's responsibility to teach in this context. In Proverbs 2, 1 and 2, it's the father teaching the son. But then, number two, you have the child's responsibility to be willing to be taught and to desire that wisdom. And that's in verses 3 and 4. So train up a child in the way he shall go, and when he is old you will not depart. You have not only the father or the parent's responsibility to teach, but you have the free moral agency of the child involved because that child has the responsibility to make a decision whether or not to become obedient to the will of God. But in this context, I don't think there's any damage to the text at all to say that godly wisdom is involved. These are principles for living. Uh, not just simply teaching the child an economic trade. But we have to remember that the parent has a part to play in this and the child has a part to play. Now, if the parent does his or her duty, the child is still responsible to become obedient to that teaching which uh, originates from God. And so that doesn't diminish at all the free moral agency of the child. Uh, it does not mean that the child is going uh, uh, to be perfect all of his or her life, but it does mean that uh, as long as a parent fulfills his or her responsibility to teach, and that child wants to conform with the will of God, then that will exist in Proverbs 22.6. Brother Coach, uh, it's interesting that the Martin Reading American Standard here says, uh, train up a child according to his way, the Hebrew, according to his way. I think it's significant what Brother Dove said. I've always, uh, I, I, for many years, thought that this, uh, this was telling us, you train up a child with the respect toward and in keeping with his bent. Children are different. We had two boys. And uh, they were as different nearly as daylight and dark as far as, you know, one of them you could do like that too, you know. Straighten up like this. The other one you had to be more forceful. <laughs> they had different bents. And we had to keep that in mind. They'll not depart from those bents. And uh, if, if when we're rearing our children, we, we keep those basic uh, bents, as it were, or what, what term did you use? Inclinations? Aptitude. But, sir, tenor of his what? But anyway, children are different. And when we're rearing them, uh, we need uh, to keep that in mind. Of course, that does not diminish our responsibility. But when we fulfilled our responsibility, brethren, it's up to the child then. Paul said, uh, Fathers provoke not your children wrath, bring them up. But the first command was, Children obey your parents. And if it's responsibility of the parents, then in the Old Testament, why did they take out and stone a disobedient child when they should have been stoning a disobedient uh, father and mother? And so uh, the responsibility rests also on the child. I think all of that is true, and I, I still insist that the train up here involves show them how to do. And the Jewish parent, read Judaism. Uh, the Jewish parent had a responsibility, and they they still insist in this, uh, persist in this. To show that child how to do a trade and study the book of Proverbs, all of it, with respect to toil and labor and working, even keeping a clean field for that matter. And show them, give them a trade or skill. And when they're old, they won't, yeah, you've got to teach them. You've got to teach them. We've got to teach them a trade. But I do not agree with the idea that when they're old, they cannot or will not apostatize. You can teach them to be turned blue in the face. And they'll still disgrace you sometimes. Yeah. Right. Danny Box from Tuscaloosa, Brother Coates. Uh, this is changing gears or shifting gears. One of the requirements that your our qualifications you talked about the other day was being out to teach. And you define that as being able to or having a knowledge of the Scriptures knowing the scriptures where you can teach, and then being willing to teach, all involved in the app to teach. Is 
a man qualified for an elder that does not teach. And I'm not talking about he's not able to, but just does not teach. Well, he's not qualified in the sense that he is not meeting that qualification, if I understand you. And one of the qualifications is that he's willing to teach. You're not only able to teach, but he's willing to teach with a pure motive, the right kind of motive. And um, I would say if he has a light, then he ought not put it under a bushel. If anybody in the world ought to be a good teacher, it ought to be a shepherd. How can he be qualified if he if he refuses to feed the flock of God which is among you? I don't think he would be, could he? Anyone else? Yes, sir, brother. What's your name? <laughs> Self-defense. When we talk about the one talent man, then we're talking about uh, a person who had an ability. We might say was out to do something. But he would not even do what he could do. And the Lord condemned him by wicked and profitable servant. Well, how is it that a person could be out to do something, teach or whatever, as it fits into Christianity or as the qualification of the elders, and then become an elder and never do it, and not fall under the condemnation of one talent man, at least in that same principle. So it seems to me apt to teach is saying, here's somebody that's apt to teach, he'll do a good job. In the parable that our Lord gave there, he gave talents in keeping with a man's ability. Now, talent is not an ability. If you don't understand that, read the blue book that I wrote. And I distinguish. Go back in the Bible and show what talents meant. It meant money, silver, metal, precious metal. So a talent was given in keeping with a man's ability to use it. A talent's not an ability, but he was expected to use that talent and not dig a hole and bury it. I think one of the greatest wastes in the church today is wasted ability. Wasted ability. I think that's a good point, David. Anyone else? Let me just comment then, if uh, you all already know everything. <laughs> Let me reflect just a moment on what the Brother McLeish said today about reaffirming some elders there. And in the June issue of the Plum Line, I quoted a statement made by some uh, people over in Taylor's, South Carolina, at the Northeast Church. And in the bulletin, and in the Plum Line, I quoted, this young lady, this woman, stood before the congregation and she gave a report the fellow who wrote the bulletin thanked her for showing us that God doesn't have any second class citizens in the church. Now the implication of that, and I wanted to come in just a minute, is the fact that if you are a part of a congregation and you do not allow the women, the sisters, to stand up before a mixed audience, then you are 
You're simply saying that God has a bunch of second class citizens in the church. Now you think about that. Moreover, if the praising of that woman for getting up before a mixed audience and speaking is a demonstration that there are no second class citizens there, then I want to know how many women preachers they've got. The implication is they'll have to have women preachers or they'll have second class citizens. Now that doesn't make good nonsense. Furthermore, if they do not have women elders in Northeast and Taylor, South Carolina, the implication is they have a bunch of second class citizens over there. Brethren, I say it lovingly and kindly, you've never yet heard a liberal say anything that made any sort of sense. And the only way, or the best way, to misrepresent a, a liberal is to say something good about them. Am I supposed to shut up with that? Okay. Come to see us in Mount Julia, Tennessee. Stay a week with me. And we'll make a crop or build a house or settle brotherhood problems or something. And I appreciate being down here so much. And brethren, continue to remember me in your prayers. Bless your heart, I need that. I really do. If you don't believe I need it, you ask my wife.